I'm John Robillard and thank you for all of you for joining us today and welcome to this really very special talk that we will have in a few minutes. This is the first Life with Phil Fall lecture. For the past few years, we have had an excellent Life with Phil speaker, our spring celebration, and I am very pleased that we are extending this tradition into the fall. I want to extend also my appreciation to everyone at the UI Foundation and beyond who have made this important event possible, and we can see this with all the people in this, in this room. And I want also to thank you for coming to hear what I know will be an inspiring talk on the life with Phil from John Papa John. Today and throughout the year, we want our entire university community, and especially you, our student, to feel the power of philanthropy and, to the, and the direct role that it plays in the learning, discovery, and the engagement that we practice each day here at the University of Iowa. Philanthropy touch everyone every day. For example, students being taught by a professor with a name chair are benefiting from philanthropy. Faculty, staff, and students who work, learn, teach, do research, and create in state-of-the-art facility are also benefiting from philanthropy. Many students who are attending the, the university with a scholarship and benefiting from philanthropy. The general public who enjoy our museum, arts programs, and many other outreach programs are also benefiting from philanthropy. These are just a few of the areas where the generosity of our alumni and friends have enhanced the University of Iowa experience and have helped us fulfill our mission through private giving. And I want to encourage everyone to participate in our Life with Phil activity and campaigns to get involved in the culture of philanthropy we are working to create on campus and to make giving back an important part of your life. Now, I am personally thrilled to have John Papa John with us today to share his thought about and his experience with philanthropy, showing how profoundly it can make an impact on our lives. And we are always inspired by the amazing example of John Papa John. He and his wife Mary are not only among the most generous supporters of the University of Iowa, but they are among our most important visionary friends. The university as a whole is much better today because the Papa Johns have not only shared their resources and treasure, but also so much of their time and talent in helping our university along the path of excellence. John Papa John grew up in Iowa and is a 1952 University of Iowa graduate. After graduation, he started his own insurance business and in 1969, became a venture capitalist. That year, he organized Equity Dynamic and continued as president today. The same year, he also founded Papa John Capital Resources, a venture capital fund primarily investing in high-tech, medical, and healthcare projects. John Papa John has served on many boards, including the University of Iowa Foundation Board of Directors. He has won numerous awards, including the National Medallion for Entrepreneurship from Beta Gamma Sigma and the Horatio Alger Award. And he is the first Iowan to receive the National Philanthropist of the Year for the Arts Award. John and his wife Mary have also been listed as among the top 200 art collector in the world by Art News Magazine. John and Mary Papa John have gifted over 100 million to various philanthropic causes, including very generous support of the University of Iowa. You no doubt recognize the Papa John name in our business building and our healthcare campus. 
John and Mary have contributed more than 25 million to fund the Papa John Entrepreneurial Center in five colleges in Iowa, including the University of, of Iowa, to promote job creation in the state. They have also granted more than four million in scholarship, including establishing a fund for ethnic disadvantaged and minority students. As you can see, Papa John philanthropy is generous, broad, and clearly visionary. The Papa John have touched the life of thousands, if not millions of people through their char charitable giving, including, I'm sure, yours. Again, I thank John, Papa John, for joining us today and for sharing some inspiring words with us. And please welcome John Papa John. Taylor Swift was in Des Moines last night. <laughs> I used to call myself the Opportunity Kid. I now call myself the Opportunity uh, Philanthropic Kid. I love being a philanthropist. I'm an immigrant, and I'm very proud of it. I came over in a boat with my mother in 1929. My mother could speak no English. We ended up in Mason City, Iowa, where my father owned a little corner grocery store, the Evia Market. I learned a lot about philanthropy at the Evia Market. Evia was the state in Greece where I was born. My grandfather was a Greek priest and his name was Father John. And when my father went through Ellis Island, they said, what's your name? He says, well, I'm one of Father John's boys. So this linguist at Ellis Island said, Papa John. So that's first generation name. <laughs> but it ended up being a plus because everybody remembers the name Papa John because of Papa John pizza. <laughs> No, I don't own Papa John's Pizza. I have no free coupons today. <laughs> All the flight attendants ask me for free coupons. But I do have a surprise for you later on. My family lived on the wrong side of the tracks in Mason City, Iowa. Across the street from my father's little grocery store it was a Grant School, it was an ethnic grade school, 29 different nationalities students went to that grade school. We had a wonderful mix. We Russians, Serbian, Bulgarians, Croatians, Hungarians, African, all the African Americans, and all the Latinos. And we all lived together and we all got along very well. We didn't have gangs in those days. Everybody, they were all nice people, but they were hungry people. They were very hungry. This was a depression. And people would steal in order to survive. They would come to my father's grocery store and steal potatoes and onions and beg for food. And that was philanthropy. That was real philanthropy. We would save chicken feet and soup bones. You have to think about this. In a depression, philanthropy is called charity. And there isn't much difference between philanthropy and charity. It depends on the time. There was a great deal of philanthropy between the haves and the have-nots. The, the depression is the main reason that I'm so passionate about philanthropy because my father's little grocery store provided credit. 
The re receivables account was terrible, terrible. People would beg for credit and we would give them credit and they couldn't pay, so we called it charity. Write downs. And as they say, it was the best of times and the worst of times. It's always the best of times and the worst of times. Grant School, my grade school, was blessed with a wonderful principal. His name was Henry Pendergraf. He became superintendent of schools in Mason City, Iowa. And he had an interest in all the children, all of the ethnics. He had great empathy. In 1933, uh, President Roosevelt signed a, a bill, the WPA, and it provided surplus food at that time, which is, I guess you could compare it today to food stamps. So every Saturday morning, I was there at the front steps of the Grant School with all of the other ethnics, and we would collect uh, raisins, crackers, and whatever the government was giving away at the time. My mother spoke no English. And as a result, I had to go to kindergarten for two years. I tell everybody I flunked kindergarten. You know anybody else that flunked kindergarten? No. <laughs> I had a wonderful teacher though. She wanted to adopt me. She, nobody else had ever spent two years in kindergarten. <laughs> we had a philosophy in my home. We always had an open home and my mother, uh, was very generous. We didn't have a telephone in our home. We, we didn't have an automobile, but we, we always invited the immigrants to come in for food and, and my mother always had enough food for company. These were Spartan times and my mother did all those things that you have to do in order to get by, including canning and fruits, vegetables, and we made our own soap with fat from fat and lye. I grew up bathing myself for years with lye soap, but I never lost my hair, so it didn't hurt. <laughs> 1941, Pearl Harbor came along. Everything changed. Everybody could get a job, and, and I had many jobs. I used to sew rings on tents for, uh, and the midnight shift. I I'm always believe that you have to save money. And I, my, my father was very frugal, and uh, we all learned to save money. So you have, to the young people, you have to learn to save money, and you have to learn how to give money. And you have to be able to do both, and you have to manage your money in order to be able to do it. Because I was of Greek descent, and because I lived on the wrong side of the tracks, even the Boy Scouts wouldn't take me. I was turned down. They told me that I was not el eligible. And if I'll show you my philanthropy list, they're not on my philanthropy list. <laughs> During the war, there was a lot of rationing. You'd, it's hard to believe rationing, but cigarettes, sugar, meat, everything was rationed at that time. And I remember one of my friends told me his mother had 200 pounds of sugar in the basement. He told me she bought it before the hoarders got it. <laughs> <laughs> my mother baked bread. She baked bread almost every day. And so friends, needy, everybody got it. Got bread and bread and Greek delicacies. The church, the church, was a stable for a, a stable environment for everybody during these times. I can say that there were no hungry Greek families during the Depression. Everybody learned. Everybody learned to share. And it's terribly important. And. Uh, I still remember, however, the po poverty. The poverty has always stayed with me, and I think one of the things I want the young people to understand is that you have to learn. You have to learn to share. You have to learn to give. And and uh, makes you feel good. Makes you feel very good. Uh, at, at
at the age of 16, uh, I had a very traumatic event. My father died. And in, in retrospect, it's probably the best thing that happened to me. It matured me and two younger brothers. My mother could still not speak English. And so uh, we would hold family meetings. We had a board meeting and we decided what we had to do. And I became a problem solver and that's helped me throughout my life. And I believe strongly that adversity is a blessing in disguise. And I, I, I keep telling young people that have problems, solve your problem, it'll make you stronger and it'll help you do better in life. When my father died, we were the recipients of charity. Everybody wanted to help us. We, we had empathy, we had, it was philanthropy. And uh, I remember my father's best friend was a little, little Greek tailor, and he would make tailor-made suits for us at cost. So even though we were poor at the time, we did have tailor-made suits. So everybody, again, that was the best thing that he could do to help us. I've always been willing to work and to do anything, any, almost any kind of work. And, and as young people, the, the, the greatest prescription for good mental health is a job. You have to keep busy. You gotta keep active and you just, you just can't slow down. And that, that work ethic and those different jobs, it gives you a database that as you grow older, you will surprise yourself how this knowledge is going to help you as you, as you prosper and, and as you move ahead. My brothers and I, uh, as a result of my father passing away, took turns working through college. It took me six years. I worked a year, went to school a year, and so it took me six years before I graduated from the University of Iowa. But I graduated from Iowa with $2,000 of cash in the bank and no debt. And I wanna make a, another statement here that's very important to the young people. Don't borrow any more money than you have to. It's so hard to pay it back. I worked 35 to 40 hours a week at Brady's Supermarket on Burlington Avenue. So wonderful people. I, I, my, one of my early jobs, uh, I'm a very proficient butcher, and uh, I used to work at the. I used to work at the store, 35 to 40 hours a week. I never went to an Iowa football game as much as I love, because I had to work on Saturdays, you know, because Saturday was a busy day at the supermarket. I got to eat smoked carp and salami. Didn't bother me. In fact, uh, I don't like it today, but I, <laughs> I ate too much of it at that time. But anyway. Uh, I've always had a desire to be rich. I used to tell my mother when I was a little boy, I'm going to be rich someday, I want to be a millionaire. And when my mother learned to, to read one day, she read in the paper that I was a millionaire. So she said to me, honey, she said, you're a millionaire, how come you're still rich, you're still working? And so you have to understand, uh, uh, I dream a lot. I, I, I dream constantly. I dream, I don't have these wild dreams. I just dream about what I want to do and what I want to give away and what, what's, what are my priorities in life. I'm 87 years old. How much time do I have and what's the best use of my time? What can I do to help the world in the time that I have left? And I, I just, it, it, I get enough sleep, but I want to tell you that that when I wake up every day, every morning, I feel wonderful. And I, I, I'm ready to go out and attack the world to do those things that, that are priorities for me. Philanthropy is high on my list. As I mentioned, I've always dreamt to be a major philanthropist. I always wanted to be the major philanthropist, philanthropist in the state of Iowa. I don't know that you all know this, but philanthropy is quite unique in America. Philanthropy was started by our pilgrims. When they came over, they had to work together and help each other in order to survive, not only against the Indians, but weather all of the problems that they had. And they, they all relied on the church to assist them. And the, the wealthy would help the poor. Uh, 
Church was very, very important. It continued to be important. Philanthropy actually became a tool for improving civilization. Andrew Carnegie built public libraries to help people get more educated. Uh, the long history of philanthropy in the United States is now deeply rooted in our DNA. The reason that you're all here today, whether you realize it or not, is that we're all believing in helping other people. This country helps all the other countries and all the other peoples in the world. Philanthropy is a way of life. And if you incorporate it in your DNA, it, begin, it becomes part of your persona. I have a rec uh, with me a record of my contributions to the University of Iowa. The foundation offered me this, and it, it's shocking. I started out giving the University of Iowa $5 a year. That's the most I could give for four years in a row, and then it became 10, and then it became 25, and it became 50. And I think that, that it was interesting. The first year that I gave $5 is the year I got married. I'm married to a wonderful lady, been married 53 years, and, and she and I agree on, 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 on uh, philanthropy. I, I have a record now, I think, 53 years in a row that I've made a contribution to the University of Iowa, and it, it depends on, every year it depends on how well I've done in business, and I think all of you that I, I, I've just got to say, you have to learn to give. You have to learn to give. Uh, once you start giving, you get addicted to it. You, you, you're going to be surprised. You, you feel good. You feel good. And I, I, I want to mention at this time that the gentleman that started the foundation at the University of Iowa was Daryl Wyrick. He was a bright, personable, and persisted, and he helped, he helped me get started at the university. And after that, it, as I mentioned, it get, you get addicted to it, and you really look forward to it. Obviously, philanthropy is alive and well in Iowa. The Forevermore campaign, a million seven, it's fantastic. 92.6 percent of the gold and one more year to go. And that's amazing for this university. 1.7 million, billion dollars, billion dollars. And uh, all of you, don't forget, if you got an extra 10 bucks, 20 bucks, the university will, will appreciate it. As great as philanthropy is, it does present some, some problems. I want to tell you about the problems. Somewhere, once you hit the newspapers and your name becomes a little prevalent, all of a sudden about, well, how about I get over 50 requests a week for money. I have an assistant we sort through, and I just want to tell you that, that it's better than the alternative, but you still, but you still get inundated, so uh, something for you to look forward to. Uh, the big problem with philanthropy is, which is the best, what's the best bang for the buck? Where do you get the best value for your money? Who should you give it to? Who should you give it to? Should it be cancer? Should it be food for the needy? Should it be research, scholarships? Club feet, one of my new projects. And so, uh, I maintain it's easier to make money than really to know who to give it to. And I say that very sincerely when you get down to the point where you have many, many organizations all need money and they all tell you, they all believe that it's the best because they, they feel that way about it. So that's one of the things you have to do is figure out where to give the money. There is no absolute best charity, so you understand. And so our philosophy is to spread around a little bit and, and give it where you think it's going to do the most good. Uh, someone asked me earlier when I, when I arrived tonight for a list of my charities. It's quite diverse. And I, I might want to read just, well, I can find my list here. 
uh, read to you. My, my CFO gave me a list of so far this year, just to give you a list of how different, how different the charities are. This happens to be a big year for us. We had a big year and we've given $11,531,950 away so far this year. But let me just tell you the diversity of, of the gifts. Church, fun for Park Avenue. That's, that's flowers for Park Avenue, New York City. We have a place in New York City and we, we think it, we should help make it beautiful. Uh, a nursing home, the Des Moines Christian School, Urban Dreams, which rehabs convicts from, from prison in Des Moines. Uh, NIAC Foundation Scholarship Fund, $50,000. University of Iowa Biomedical Medical Building, one of our favorite projects, thanks to Dr. Robillard. Uh, McNatter Museum, just, uh, just a very diverse list. And so when you go through at the time, at the time when you make, make out a check, you feel that it is the best place to spend that money at that time. And it goes on and on. Scholarships, to me, uh, always on top of the list. I think we have to help young, young people to get an education in order to be able to make a living and to go on out and help other people. Scholarships are very important. Uh, my wife and I give scholarships to every student, every student that goes to college in to the churches that we belong to, regardless of academics. I, 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 we give to several academic scholarships too, but to every, every student that goes to school in our churches, because I don't like to discriminate uh, in terms of who's doing best. It's hard in this world to figure out who's gonna be the, who's gonna do the best. And many times the non-scholarship students do better. So we, we do not discriminate there. We, we give to Horatio Alger is one of my favorite organizations. They've given over $100 million in scholarships away. Uh, uh, they're doing that every year now, and they do it all in academics. We participate in that also. So we, they, they pick, and we don't, we don't pick, we don't select students for scholarships. We do what I call the fund of funds, and that means that we give to for instance, uh, uh, entrepreneurial scholarships, which I'm very, very excited about entrepreneurship in the world, and especially in Iowa, and especially at the University of Iowa. We, we give the scholarship and the university decides which students should benefit from it, so we don't get involved in that process. We have, we, we're more involved in trying to create the value and let somebody else decide who the beneficiary should, should be. Uh, New, new needs come up all the time. I noticed here, one of my friends, uh, John Buchanan is here, and we've gotten involved in club feet. 200,000 children in the world get club feet every year. And a Dr. Ponzetti, who used to be here at the University of Iowa, created a, a way to, to non-surgical to, to solve club feet. And so uh, I think it's a wonderful charity and we're involved in it and happy to be involved in it. And we think that it, it, it eventually will help 200,000 a year, uh, 200,000 children a year be economically effective and give them a normal life and they can go out and do the things that you and I do every day. Oh, I have empathy for the Syrian people as an example that are having problems coming over. Uh, I want to mention that there's a, there's a Greek organization, it's a feedback, it's called the Hellenic Initiative, they've raised eight and a half million dollars so far, and it's to create, to create jobs in Greece and to help the economy turn around, and things are very bad there also. And as a result, uh, I've started uh, entrepreneurial centers in Greece on a pro bono basis, non-profit, <clears throat> and so we've started <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, somewhere between 50 and 100 little businesses, and 
So it's another project that, that I believe in is to help people to learn to, to create and make a living and create jobs. Very, very, very important. Very important. Again, I don't know what the best charity is, but you have to remember, you've got to remember your university where you get your education that, that helps create you to create value. And uh, excuse me. I work because I want to keep making more money so that I can give more money away. Uh, I think it's a good cause, and my wife supports me, and I think that's very important. You have to have a, for, for the spouses, you have to have an understanding, otherwise I'm a workaholic, and I love being a workaholic. I don't, I don't work, my, my job is fun. I have fun. I create, I make money, and I give it away, and I can't think of a, a better job in the whole world than what I do, and I feel very good about it. And I'm very lucky, very lucky to have good health and to be able to do this. Uh, and the, 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 what makes us feel the best are these thank yous that we get in the mail. Responses like, uh, thank you for your contribution to the hospital. My son survived cancer treatment. He now has a future. Your scholarship allows me to continue in college. I'm the first member of my family to go to college. My daughter will now be able to walk and can contribute to society. My favorite thank you, this one I, I really like. I'm on the street in New York and this guy says, thanks, mister. He says, your five bucks will buy me a room and a hot meal. And they, they have, that's what it costs in New York. The government has, uh, New York City has facilities for these people. And you know what, it makes you feel good. Philanthropy doesn't have to take a lot of money. It just, and I think you just, it's a state of mind, a state of mind. And when I looked, when I came in and looked up there, it said, Phil was here, Phil is here. Phil is here today, and Phil is with you every day, and is with me every day. I, I consider myself every day to be a philanthropist. Every little thing that you do for people, and I'm a PMA, a PMA believer, positive mental attitude. So whatever I do, I always try to look at the right side, the bright side of things. And, and it makes you feel good. You help people and it. It may be a little, a little item, but it, it does, it does uh, make a difference. Uh, one of the, the biggest philanthropic commitments, obviously, is to the University of Iowa. I got a great education here. I was an immigrant. When I came to Iowa, I didn't know about, I didn't know about cashmere sweaters. I didn't know about anything. So I learned here. I associated with, and I, I moved into a fraternity, and I, my roommates all had more money, and they had cars, and, and all of a sudden I grew up. It, it's part of the process of learning, and I, did, I, I gained a lot here. I got a great education. I love my, my economics classes and I was able to work, as I mentioned before, and go to school and benefit from it. And I, and I matured, I matured here. I grew up and learned how to, how to live with people, get along, and uh, I got smart here. And that, that's what allows me to make a living. I might add that I had a, I needed surgery at the University of Iowa, I had no insurance, so I was, uh, gave me a free surgery, it was kind of interesting. They put me in the ward with all of the young kids from the penitentiary, so. <laughs> Believe it or not, I was in the ward for 20 days. I've never had a visitor. It was pretty depressing. <laughs> and for those of you that know, sure, I, had, I was a bleeder and I was bleeding and they couldn't stop it and Dr. Shorty Paul came in. He was the team physician at the University of Iowa. He says, hell, I don't know what to do. I'm listening. He says, plug, he says, plug his nose up with cotton and let's see if it stops. So anyway, but they did help me. And the interesting, the, 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 doctor, the doctor at Student Health, I always thought I had a crooked nose. I wanted to be better looking. So he said that when you get done, John, he says, we'll do plastic surgery for you free. 
So after that, I said, no way. <laughs> so, so I still have a broken nose, but I can breathe at night. And that's what, that's what, that's what the surgery did for me. So, well, I got to tell you, uh, I keep re reminding you, Who wants to be a philanthropist today? Who wants to be a philanthropist? I want to ask you, this crowd here today, I'm so overwhelmed. Who wants to be a philanthropist? Raise your hand. Come on. I want to know who wants to be a philanthropist. Well, I've got a surprise for you. You can be a philanthropist today because we have something special for you. Lynette, we have what we're going to do is we're gonna pass, pass out envelopes. And in that envelope, you will find philanthropist for the day, fill for the day. You're gonna find a $10 bill. And, it, and together with it is a little card that says, I hereby give to the University of Iowa in which department? Athletics, music, history. You can give it to any department you want. All you do is fill it out. There's no other obligation. And you will be a philanthropist for the day. Now. I have a bet. I have a bet with Lynette. Please don't let me down. I told her that everybody's going to sign up. We got enough $10 bills for a thousand of you, so everybody sign up. It doesn't cost you anything, and it doesn't beyond just sign up. Now I have another another challenge, though. That's just the beginning, because if if you sign up, and by the way, you don't have to. You don't have to. If you'd rather go to the airliner and you want to buy beer with it, okay. <laughs> but I want to tell you. Your conscience is going to bother you. <laughs> Imagine philanthropist for the day or a couple of beers. <laughs> so now, but here's the rest of it. If you sign up, give us your email address and Please complete the card and you can drop them off. There will be boxes at the back in order, it's voluntary. If you will give each year for the next four years, 10 bucks a year, I'll match that. We'll set up a little fund and that will cover you. And you could be a philanthropist for five years, which was, it took me 10 years to get there. So you can do better than I did. You can do better than I did and you can be a philanthropist at your university at your university please wear the fill for the day button you know it should say fill forever the next time we print that button it should say fill forever because that's what philanthropy is all about it isn't one day it's every day I'm happy to be alive, as you can tell. I'm happy to be healthy. I'm happy to be in this wonderful country of America where we can all experience the American dream. And life is what you give back. Remember that a successful life includes service to society and our fellow man. That's philanthropy. This is how we will be judged. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, thank you, thank you. And God bless America.
Fill out your cards, please. And while you're, while you're filling out the cards and the $10 bill, <laughs> you know, I, I've got some quotes, some famous people. These are really great philanthropic quotes. Warren Buffett says, if you're the luckiest 1% of humanity, you owe it to the rest of humanity to think about the other 99%. He gave half of his estate away. Uh, uh, it's not what you have, but what I do is my kingdom. Carnegie said, wealth is not to feed our egos, but to feed the hungry. So it goes on and on and on. Thank you again for being here. Uh, thank you for being for listening to me, and uh, again, God bless America, and thanks, and good luck to all of you. Thank you so much, Mr. Papajam. We're grateful for your inspiration and your challenge. What can I do to help the world in the time I have left? I think we'll all remember this day. Thanks for being here and remember his challenges and go Hawks. <laughs>